All right, so a brief outline of what we're going to cover. Even though the list is short, we're going to try to cover a lot. Uh, so as always, we're going to talk about how to get started really quickly. This time, uh, we're going to get started with, with, quickly with uh, uh, generated networks. And uh, we'll also take a look at how to compare different networks in a graphical way. Then uh, something that cannot miss from any cannot be missing from any sumo tutorial is the look at OSM Web Wizard. So we will be generating a scenario with a few clicks, and then we're going to do a simulation on this scenario. Uh, we will uh, this time uh, look closer at bicycle simulations, um, and then we will um, uh, see how we can analyze the scenario and get some nice graphics out of it to summarize what the scenario has been doing. And not only are we going to run the scenario once, but we're going to run it multiple times and do analysis on that. Looking very much forward to that. All right. So first things first, net generate. Uh, so this is a tool that generates uh, synthetic networks. For example, simple Manhattan grid, as you see here but also other variants up to very random things or uh, things that try to look like a real city. This tool uh, has been in existence for pretty much 20 years right now. Uh, I did a little bit of digging. And so in 2003, Daniel Klachevich, the father of Sumo, uh, you can surely call him that, he started uh, with the first commit on the network generator. Um, but now, uh, we have this uh, with a UI, with a graphical user interface. So let's see how that goes. Start the net edit. And we have a new menu here. It's the generate the network menu. And here we have a dialogue. And I said three clicks. So don't be too, too stringy with the counting. So let's say one click to open the dialogue. Let's say another click to pick the output file. Um, let's put this here. A short name. And of course, we have to pick the type of network we want to generate. I'm going to go for a grid and run this. This dialog tells us that everything went all right. And we have our network here. Very nice. Mm, so um, this is uh, now uh, the network with the default settings. Uh, let's do something a bit more advanced. So let's go to the dialogue again. Um, and this time, well, I'm going to give it a new name. Something else here. And go to the advanced dialogue. And here, for all the different kinds of networks that you have, there are settings. So since we're, we want to generate a grid, we're gonna customize the values here. So the X number, that's the, the, the width of the grid in X direction and the Y number is this. Um, oh, and by the way, the values you see here, the default values, they're not actually the, the, the correct default values. This is already fixed in the next version. Nevertheless, this is just a visual thing. So you will still have the correct default when you run it. Just be aware that right now it doesn't show the values. All right, so what else do we set? Um, let's um, have a bit of randomness here. Let's randomize the number of lanes that each row gets. And so you may wondering what is the range in which we randomize? Well, it's the number of lanes. Uh, and this can be set here in the building defaults. So somewhere here, is the default lane number. We're going to set this to two, and then every edge will have either one or two. Let's run this. That worked all right. And we have our net. As you expected, it's a bit wider, it's not as high. And if you zoom in, you see that the number of lanes varies all over the place. All right. So this is net generate. Uh, I hope uh, you can enjoy it. Um, and now um, 
we'll look at the difference between those two networks. Well, how do we do this? We can I'll talk very quickly between them. Uh, see their difference? Well, great. Um, actually, um, when I work with, net, with networks, this is what I sometimes do. I, uh, the, the eye is really good at spotting small differences. Uh, so it may work, uh, but there are, of course, better ways. So let's talk about another tool. Um, so we talked about net generate. Now let's talk about net diff. That's a Python tool for computing differences between networks. And you can think of this a bit like math. You have two networks, A and B, and the difference between them, well, that's also some kind of file. And just like with real math, you can undo subtraction, you can do addition. Um, so if you use this net diff tool to compute the difference between two network files, then later you can reconstruct the network based on the difference. So um, let's say you started with network A, did some changes and arrived at network B. These changes are held in this difference file, or rather actually the set of files. And now at a later point, you can apply these differences to network A and get network B. Now, why would you want to do this? You can actually uh, do some uh, semantic versioning on your networks, or you can record manual changes. Let's say you start with an, with an open street map derived network, and as usual, you have to do some manual fixing on that. Um, and then at some later point, you would like to upgrade. You would like to update your OSM data, and you don't want to redo all the fixes. So what do you do? You take the raw OSM net and the network with, the, with your fixes and compute the differences. And then at a later time, you update OSM, get a new raw network, and apply your differences again. And in most instances, most of your differences will still apply. I mean, as always, if you do patches uh, and uh, the part that you type changed, then you have to do some manual corrections, but it can save a lot of work. Uh, a lot of manual work that you already did, you don't have to read. All right, so that's not actually new. Uh, that has been available for quite some time. But what's new is the fact that you can now uh, have a visual impression of the difference between two networks uh, because the network tool is now integrated in network. All right, so let's uh, start with this thing here. This was the original network. Let's call this network A. And I'm going to start the open the new tools menu. We've seen quite a bit of this today. This is one of the new features in number 17. And here we have the net diff tool. Um, now we have to uh, put in here the path of the networks that we want to compare. There is this handy little button use current network, this current item. So A is going to be the, the network we looked at first. And then let's open up the other thing. Open the second run. And um, now I select all the differences that I want to see. Uh, the shapes for modified, added, and deleted things. And let's go. So what do we see here? Compared to the original network, some stuff was added. We see this in green. Some stuff was removed. We see this here in red. And some stuff was modified. We see this as this uh, orange overlay. You recall that uh, the advanced network had some random lane number. So uh, the, the number of lanes were changed. The edges are still there, well, they're neither red nor green. So this gives you an impression of the changes between two networks. And if your colleagues did something to your network, now you're going to find out exactly what they did. So I hope you uh, can make good use of this. Moving on to the next topic. I hope all of you present here in the audience know this tool already. It's, uh, it's a Python tool that helps you 
to get started with sumo simulations again with about three clicks. Mm. You uh, can find this tool in the tools menu of your sumo installation and it will open up a, a web browser uh, to let you select a piece of a map based on a, a rendering of open street map data. Um, you can select the road types that you want to import and the traffic modes that you want to see. Um, take note that even though the data is the real deal, real as open street map provides it, the traffic will be random. Um, but you can configure which modes you want to see and the volume of traffic and also what amount of traffic is coming from outside versus being generated within the network. For example, if you have a small network, then most of it is going to be food traffic, presumably, so you can figure that already. And you can import public transport. This is a mix of, of real data and, and uh, generated things. So it's the real, the real routes and the real stops as they are found in OpenStreetMap, but as OpenStreetMap doesn't have a detailed schedule, um, at best it has the periods, uh, the scenario will have um, a, a synthetic schedule that follows all the known effects. Um, and then, of course, we can configure how long the scenario should run, so how long the traffic should uh, be coming in, um, and you will also uh, obtain background shapes and buildings uh, and even satellite background images. And all the files will be downloaded automatically for you to rebuild the scenario and rerun it. And so, as I said, you can find this uh, in the tools folder of Sumo. Just launch the OSM web wizard for the time. And here will be the web browser and do the selection. And in the end, you click generate scenario. So today I've prepared something that doesn't have any cars in it, only bicycles. So maybe it's a bit of a preview of the of the keynote that we're going to hear tomorrow. Uh, here in the web version, the modes you select have some subtle side effects. So uh, as soon as you select bicycles, the the way the network is being imported. Uh, it will generate additional, well, it will import all the infrastructure for bicycles. If you do a car only simulation, maybe you don't want all these bike lanes. They just uh, clog up the network, get in the way, uh, detract from what you're interested in. But here, as soon as you select this, you will have all the uh, extra bicycle lanes in the network. Um, I'm not going to run this now because this connection here is notoriously slow. Instead, I'm going to switch over to the file I already prepared. You can find that in the wizard folder. All the scenario files uh, are available for download on the tutorial page. So maybe let's go back real quick to show you what I mean. In the Sumo documentation, there's the tutorials subpage, and here you can find all the past conference tutorials with a link to the download of the slide deck and the example. All right, so when you run the web wizard, then it will open up a simulation for you uh, that will look like this. Uh, and let's yeah, let's just run it and have a look. As I mentioned, this is a simulation where I activated on bicycles. All bicycles are small. Maybe we have to make them a bit more visible. And let's see. Well, they're still pretty small. Let's make them even bigger. So there are, of course, some controls. Very big. And here you have a random bicycle traffic. And well, who can spot the location? Who can figure out where this is? <laughs> yes. It's here. We're, we are we are in the rotunda, which is this uh, uh, circular. Thing. And here is the train station on which many of you presumably arrive. Uh, as I said, this is random traffic. That's not uh, terribly realistic. Also, the lack of cars is not uh, does not reflect the current state of traffic and other so. Um, 
there's something else that you get when starting the scenario. Maybe you have seen such things in your own uh, web wizard scenarios. There is a there is a warning message here about some traffic lights. So let's talk about this real uh, quick. We're here. Ah, yes. But before we do, let's take a brief look at all the files that were generated by the work version. So you get a whole directory of, of stuff uh, and uh, don't get overwhelmed. Most of these files are simply the inputs for the scenarios. You have your sumo config file, which loads all the things, which binds everything together. You have, of course, the, the network file. Uh, these are uh, gzip by default nowadays. Uh, you may not know the sumo can handle all files uh, that end in xml.gz, which are gzip. Um, and you, if you give these as input, it will just uh, uh, deflate them. And um, if you use these paths as output files, it will already automatically write gzip files, which can be quite useful to conserve space. So the, the web wizard now saves the network in zip format. We have the bicycles which we generated. We have the polygons that we saw in the background, for example, the, the building we're in. And then you have some settings for how the view should look. And for rebuilding the scenario, we have the wall OSM, OSM data and the configuration files there, rebuilding the, the shapes of the thing. And also a file for rebuilding the random shape. If you're interested in those details, Go look at the last two tutorials where I spent more time. So we looked at the simulation. Um, there, there were, were these warnings. So let's uh, briefly discuss what these are about. Um, by, the, by default, the, the, the web wizard uh, doesn't know anything about traffic lights in, in the real world except for their presence. They are there. And even that is dodgy. Um, so uh, the, the, pro, the process that, that builds the simulation network, net convert is the application for that, it uh, takes some liberties to generate, uh, to generate plausible signal plans. And it also uh, takes the liberty to assume that all these um, traffic lights are traffic actuated, which means the roads are equipped with detection equipment and the traffic lights by default, react to the traffic that they detect. Basically, making the phases longer when there's lots when there's a large queue, and aborting the, the, the green phase if there's no more traffic, in the world, which makes the flow a lot more efficient. Uh, and well, this is the best we can do if we don't know anything about the traffic lines. So let's not make it uh, even less efficient than uh, And so this warning tells us that uh, the this, this, uh, actuation, this traffic actuation doesn't work for some reason. So the, the way the, the phases are laid out doesn't really fit the way detectors are placed on the lanes. Uh, and so it, it just tells us this, this automatic uh, actuation will not work. Here. And uh, there's actually an option in Sumo to make the traffic lights a bit smarter and deal with these situations. Uh, there's an option you can set. Um, then traffic lights will detect jams and automatically switch into the next phase to avoid some, some bad situation. So this is something that you can set if you want to get rid of the warning. Keep it in mind, it will be, it will, uh, we will come back to this later. But now that we have our basic scenario, let's do a more detailed bicycle simulation. Why bicycles? Well, because uh, they're good for the environment and presumably we'll want to have lots more bicycles in our cities in the future. So. Uh, let's take this as a forward-looking simulation. Uh, and the detail that we want to see is bicycles overtaking each other on the bicycle lane. As you know, uh, the cars uh, in Sumo, well, they overtake when there are more lanes, but on a single lane, they don't typically overtake. The bicycles, they should be able to do this on a single bike path if it's wide enough, they should overtake. So we should make sure that the bike paths are are actually wide enough, one meter won't do. Um, and we have to activate the sublane model in Sumo, which uh, does these uh, dynamics within a lane to, 
for example, allow this overtaking, we have to add more bicycles. Uh, right now in the simulation, we saw that it wasn't just, just wasn't enough traffic to, to see these situations. And then we also have to give the bikes a reason to overtake. So some of them, uh, well, they should have a desire to drive faster than some other bikes. Then we can see these overtaking actions. The good news is uh, with, uh, within the last uh, few versions, uh, we did improvements to bicycle simulations and now this distribution of speeds is working out of the box. Uh, going back to Sumo 114, you would have to do some very detailed steps to actually make them overtake because by default, they all wanted to drive at the exact same time. All right, and if we have managed all these things, then we can um, uh, make some nice plots and even run the scenario multiple times. Okay, so start with making the bicycle lanes wider. There are two ways to go about this. One way, um, which I'm only gonna mention briefly, is to, to deal with it at the stage where the scenario is imported from OpenStreetMap. Um, not every lane in OpenStreetMap comes with a width information attached. So there's a process that puts in default values somewhere. These are, of course, customizable by the user, so in your Sumo installation, you find a few files that pertain to these defaults. Um, they are all documented here on the slide. So you can look at that and you can change the value from these files and then your network will have different labels. But we're not gonna do this now. Instead, we're gonna look at how to do this efficiently in NetEd. So we want to widen the bicycle. Let's go to uh, the folder O2 NetEdit. So um, this is what the simulation looks like. I can launch NetEdit directly from here with Control T, uh, which can be a convenient way to, to launch NetEdit on a specific network. Um, and now um, I could click on a single bicycle lane and find the width attribute and change this. But while there are lots of bicycle lanes in the network, this is not very efficient and I might uh, forget some. So let's use the selection mode. I press the letter S, but also press this little button that I pick for hotkeys and you have all the hotkeys we call it. You don't, you won't miss out on the fun. So then I'm gonna select uh, objects in the network by their attribute. I want to select lanes based on the attribute allow. And I want those lanes where allow has the exact value bicycle. The equal sign uh, forces an exact match. And now I have uh, selected 172 bicycle lanes. And the next thing I want to do is change the attribute, all of them at once. Now, careful here. If I just click on this road, Somewhere here, I'm going to have this, this, this edge object selected, uh, well, inspected rather, which I don't want. I want to have these lanes. So I do a shift click on this lane. That's one way to go about it. Uh, the other way is to, to uh, set the checkbox here, which makes every click in, interact with lanes rather than edges. And now I have the uh, I am inspecting uh, actually a selection of all these 170 lanes, 72 lanes at once. And I can see they even come with different attributes. Some of them have the value one, some of them have the value 1.5. And I'm going to change all of them to 1.6 and be done with it. Now I can change the network and they all have the width I want. Um, but I'm going to do uh, one more thing. Uh, as mentioned earlier, I want to activate the sublane model. So now this is an option uh, that gets set when running the simulation. It's not part of the network. You have to, can run the same network with different values of, of detail um, and not change the network. But you can use NetEdit to, to set the option because now we have um, a way to, to configure um, to, to, to define sumo config files. This is the new menu item here, shift F10, sumo options. 
and there we can define the processing tab. This value here, lateral resolution, and set it to 0 0.8. If you notice that that's just half of the width of the, the bicycle lane, so we going to split it into sub lanes where bicycles can overtake. Uh, and it also neatly divides the default road for 3.2 meters. Um, and as an added bonus, I'll set this option here about the jam threshold, which I mentioned earlier, to make that warning go. And now I can save the sumo configuration wherever I want. All right. Well, so that was that start with that that part of the preparation for having the bicycle simulation. Widen the lanes, uh, set some define a sumo configuration. Um, the next thing we of course have to do is define some more bicycles. And uh, during the last tutorial, I already discussed how to define flows of cars. Uh, so this is boring. Instead, we're going to define flows of persons that happen to ride their bike. All right. So before we start, let's get rid of this uh, selection here. I'll just uh, go back to select mode and I press escape. And so now nothing is selected anymore. And I want to define persons or rather the whole flow of persons. For this, I have to enter another mode uh, right here. These are all the modes you see for modifying the network. And then we have these super modes here, network, demand, and data. And I go to the demand super mode. That's hot key of three. Two goes back to the network, and three is the demand. And then I go to the person mode, uh, pressing hot key P is this little person button here, other ones. All right. So already we have some color coding of the network. We see some uh, places where persons cannot go. This is uh, here, conflict, cyan, uh, no, actually magenta, magenta. And then in dark green, we have all the places where persons could stop. So let's have the persons start at the train station, then go to the DLR, take part in the conference and return back to the train station. That's that's the idea, but we don't want a single person. Instead, we want a whole flow. Of so that's the person flow here. Uh, for every flow, just for like a as a vehicular flow, we have to define how long it's going to go and what the spacing is going to be. So let's have a flow for one thousand seconds. Well, that was ten thousand. Put a thousand, and we could have an even spacing just setting how many objects per hour we want or with a fixed period, but we're gonna choose Poisson distribution where uh, an average uh, um, every, well, every two seconds, one, one person should start. Um, right. And now um, we, we define among, we, we pick among this list of things that the person could do the person twip from one edge to another edge, that's actually the default already. And by default, those persons could just walk. There is no, there is, a, well, that's the default behavior, but uh, in the modes field here, we could select also that they have their own car or that they can use public transport. And we say, well, they should ride bicycles. This is what we put in here, modes bicycle. And then of course they will prefer this to walking if they can, unless we happen to define a network where bicycles are forbidden. So um, we have to pick a start somewhere. So let's start uh, on this edge here at the train station. And then let's go to the deal off. That would be easy. All right. And let's just switch to a slightly, no, I'll show you that. All right, so let's go to the DLR here. And uh, this is the first leg of the journey, right? 
uh, we confirm this with enter and then the person flow is great. Now uh, we want to, to uh, add more stages or more, more lags to this plan. And for this, we need a, new, a different mode. Uh, we pick the person flow that we want to work on, the one we just created. And now the difference here is in the first mode, we had to pick an origin and a destination. Now we only have to pick destinations because all well, these things are changed implicitly. Changed. And so uh, let's uh, enter uh, a, a stop. So let's stop at the DLR and take place in the conference. That would be the stop on an edge. And of course, the conference is a lengthy affair. Let's say all together we spent here eight hours. So I put in eight um, colon zero colon zero, which corresponds to eight hours. And let's have uh, the stop. So that's the second part of what the persons do. Um, actually, let's go back and say what the persons are doing. Let's say that's that's the sooner. 23. All right, I just hit undo to go back. Now, the final stage. Let's go back to the train station. Again, we have the person trip from edge to edge with the mode bicycle. And now we only click final destination on the train station. And that's it. We have defined our person flow that goes by bike and returns by bike. We can go to inspect mode, inspect mode. And here in the lower corner, lower left corner, we see those three elements of the plan. Person flow, the stop, and go again. All right, let's run this simulation. I'm going to go back to something I prepared. Um, All right, so let's run this. We have the bicycles, they come in here. You can see them, and they're already riding two uh, in pairs next to each other. This, this is the way they queue at the traffic light. And then they go to the deal R uh, here. So then they should arrive. Oh, they're already queued here. Let's stop this. So if I do a right click, I see that there are actually tons of persons stacked in this place. And now if I keep running the simulation, speed this up a bit, then at some point the conference will be over sadly enough and everybody will start to go home. Now this is our scenario. Let's do some analysis. Just all these things. You can find them all if you go back to the slides. And if you want to look up how we did this. Now, to evaluate the scenario, it's not enough to look at it. The whole purpose of the simulation is to generate all these nice output files. And so let's do that. Um, Windows. Um, so, of course, in the past, you would have to uh, put all the outputs, define all the outputs that you wanted to have in the Sumo configuration file, and you would have to uh, write those XML files by hand, or at least write the options on the command line and have Sumo generate the config file for you. Uh, you don't have to do that anymore. In the, in the sumo config setting dialog that I already mentioned, 
we also have this output section. Um, and so um, we can select all the outputs that we want here. Uh, right now, it's still a bit of typing involved, but uh, this will be, well, it's already planned to make this dialog even less. So let's have some trip info output here. And another feature that's rather new is that you can split everything that belongs to the person in a separate output file. So let's have the person info in another file here. And then let's have some statistics. This is very useful. The statistic output basically gives you a summary on, on all the trips that were part of the simulation. So how long did they take an average? What was the average speed? All these things. And let's also have an edge data output defined as a file. So there it is. All right, so edge data, some of you may know it. It's one of the outputs that aggregates values uh, spatially. So for every simulation edge, you have an aggregation of how much cars went along that edge, how, how fast were they driving, how much time was lost on that edge. And of course, you can set all kinds of attributes like this should be aggregated for five minutes or per hour or over the whole simulation. And because there are so many attributes, you have to usually have to uh, define this in an XML file, put all the attributes there. But if you want something real quick, you just set the option edge data output to some file. And it will give you an aggregation that runs over the whole simulation with the default settings. All right. And then, of course, you save the sumo configuration and run the simulation. Um, I did all this. Uh, and the results are here in this uh, run final folder that's part of the files. And well, then let's look at some data. Um, let's look, for example, at those stats is not fine. All right, so this is kind of hard to read. Um, better, right? All right, so we have all kinds of statistics. We have the performance, how long did the simulation run, how many vehicles were loaded, how many persons that we had. So as you can see, uh, we had this uh, Poisson distribution running for 1,000 seconds, generating uh, an expected value of 1.5 persons per second. And if you do random things, well, then you won't get the exact half of it. So we have here 470 persons. Uh, that were generated, and each of them had uh, two bicycle trips, one from the station and one back to the station. So here we have and twice as many vehicle trips recorded in the simulation. And uh, uh, something else we can see is that for matter of convenience, the bikes actually have their separate uh, section in the output. So usually you have one for bikes and then one for all the other vehicles because they tend to be quite different. From other modes, try. Um, and so we see the average route length about kilometer. That's uh, well, you can walk this, but it's quite convenient to have a bike. The average speed and the waiting time here. So the waiting time, the time the bikes spend stop mostly at traffic lights, um, and this is uh, part of the overall time loss. Time loss means well, they would have like to go faster but couldn't for some reason. So time loss includes the, the parts where they just stood still, but also the parts where they were slowed down, presumably by other slower bikes or some other feature. Um, and so the, the time loss should always be at least as big as the weight. Um, and then we have another statistic here. This is a statistic on the rides that the person still. So obviously it's the same as the number of vehicles because we only had these 
byte. Uh, but as you can see here, we have another value for the waiting time. The route length matches, it's the same value as here, but we have, a, have another waiting time value. So what is this? Well, from the perspective of the bikes, the waiting time is the time where they couldn't drive. But from the perspective of the persons, the waiting time is the time before they could start driving. So you will mostly have this, uh, obviously have this in public transport, you're waiting at this bus stop and the bus doesn't come. So this is your waiting time before the ride actually starts. Um, in this case, uh, the bikes weren't running on any kind of public transport schedule. It was rather the fact that they couldn't all fit on the road at the same time. So it's, you could say they were all in some imaginary uh, bicycle parking area and couldn't get uh, on, onto the, the bike lane faster. So this is the waiting time. All right. Um, so these are values that we get out of the single file that summarizes the whole simulation, but maybe it's a bit too condensed. Maybe we're not seeing enough what really happened. So let's use another tool to, to, to get a better grip on these statistics. Um, going back to the slides. All right, so. Uh, one thing we can do is uh, we could um, get statistics directly from, from the trip info file uh, and recompute not only the mean value of all these attributes that we saw here, but also the standard deviation and in the, in the different modes and maybe figure out uh, what the minimum and maximum values were as well. This is always a good idea, a good summary statistic to have some, well, to have more than the mean. And um, for this, we use the tool attributesstats.py. It's a Python tool that has been part of Sumo for quite some time, uh, but probably not so many people knew about it. And now there's a more discoverable form of the tool uh, that you can, where you can use it via the new tools dialog. So let's go back to net edit and use the tools dialog. So that's in the output section, attribute stats. We select the data file that we want to do a summary on. So this is whatever came out of the run. We select the trip info file and that's it already. When we press run, it will already give us all these statistics. Now, of course, this is a bit hard to, to see on the screen, on the big screen. So I put this on the slides for you to see in detail. So now for every attribute in every element um, that's, uh, that was found in this uh, trip info file, we have more statistics. So we have statistics on the, uh, on, on the trip info of the on the trip infos of the bicycles, but also statistics on the on the rides, and we can see how uh, we we can see the values that we already discussed in the context of the statistic output, the the, uh, the travel time, the time lost, the waiting time, and again the the different values for waiting time uh, for the bikes and the rides, because there were different perspectives, uh, and what we also see here. Uh, is the minimum and maximum values, and we even get the ID of the objects. Well, in this case, the ID of the bicycle that were responsible for those minimum and maximum values. And then we could go back in the simulation and see what exactly this bike has been doing in order to reach this uh, maximum waiting time. Maybe there was something interesting about this bicycle. Mm -hmm. But I, I, I highlighted something here. It's, we see that there's a huge uh, deviation in the waiting time. So in the, in the waiting time of the rides, that is in the time it took for the rides to start. And at this point, uh, we should really take a look at a picture rather than at all these dry numbers. So let's do that. We go back to the tools menu. And this time we're going to use a visualization tool. This is plot XML attributes. And we're gonna, we're going to plot the 
uh, waiting times of the bicycles, well, actually of the rides. So I'm selecting here the recursion info file, and I'm selecting the attributes that I want to plot against each other. So let's see what I had in mind. Um, let's put on the x-axis the departure time, and on the y-axis, let's put the waiting time, the one with the high deviation. All right, and at least in this version, uh, you still have to click this checkbox. It's going to be default in this version. And now, what we're seeing is this. <laughs> that's that's kind of hard to read, admittedly. Um, the reason we're seeing these lines is that data points are grouped by ID and each bicycle occurred twice in the simulation, once on the, on the leg to the VR and again on the leg back. And so by default, these data points are connected with lines. So let's go back and make this a scatter plot instead. And it will be much cleaner. So now we have this. We clearly see the two distinct phases in the simulation. And now we can start to understand what's happening. So in the first part of the simulation, we have all these bytes from the from this person flow. And as we said, uh, we, we set this to, to run over 1000 seconds and start with, well, of course, with the random spacing, but the, the departures were spread out over time. So um, pretty much whenever they, they wanted to start, it didn't take them too long to find a freeze place on the road. But on the return leg, well, we, we set the conference um, to run until the fixed time. So regardless of when the persons arrived, the conference was over at the same time for all of them. So they all wanted to go back to the train station at the same time, but there was still not enough road space. And so the guy who got on the road last, the girl, they had to wait wait some time, quite some time for the for for them to find space on the road. So this is why this this time until the ride started was so different between these two phases of the simulation. And I think this is really something you need a picture for. This is hard to, to get from the raw data. All right, so this having been uh, satisfactorily explained, let's have another look at uh, the workings of the simulation. So we go back again, and this time, plot the time loss. After all, that's a, uh, that's a very common statistic to evaluate the efficiency of a traffic scenario. And well, again, we see these two uh, phases in the simulation, but we see something else very clearly in the second half, there was quite a bit more time loss than in the beginning. And why would that be? I mean, there's, this is once they get on the road, once there's actually space on the road, uh, they should be going as fast in that way as in the other way. So there's, that's, that's unexplained. And uh, in the best clickbaity manner, the answer for this will surprise you. So <laughs> stay tuned. Um, all right. So, um, the next thing we want to do to get a deeper understanding of what's happening here is look at some spatial performance measures. We're going back to the edge data. So how much time was lost on, on different edges of the simulation. And uh, one thing you could do is after the simulation is done, just uh, load the edge data into your simulation. So let's... Uh, um, start the simulation again. And now a small trick here. Um, I've, I've used the sumo config to launch the network and take a look at it. Uh, but um, what I launched was this configuration file, whereas I ran the simulation with this other configuration. So look at the difference. The, the one config had all the outputs defined. And the other config, aptly named no output, didn't have all the definitions for the output files. 
Uh, otherwise, by just launching this content again, I would have started to rewrite the output files and all the data that I already recorded would have been overwritten. Now, didn't, that wasn't what I wanted. So I prepared another config to just launch this conveniently. And now what I can do is I can load the edge data into my simulation. Uh, all you get from this is the summary of all the attributes that were in there. It says uh, data between uh, time zero and time 30,000, and it loaded attributes such as arrive and waiting. Obviously, it's a small thing to read. Nevertheless, it will be there. And now, to make use of this, we're going to recolor the rows. We're going to recolor them by edge data. And then we have to pick the attribute by which we want to color. We're going to pick the time loss. And then we need a coloring scheme. So uh, one way to get this is to uh, build it automatically from the data that is loaded. Apologies, I know that a rainbow is not an appropriate coloring uh, scale for scientific data. There have been lots of papers and reports on that. And I have it cleanly on my agenda to, ch to change this. But for now, you have to make do with a rainbow. Sorry. So now we have a legend that tells us what these values mean. Red is, is the low end and uh, purple is the high end. And we can look at these values and see very clearly that this one bicycle lane here had all the waiting time. Um, if we don't uh, trust our eyes with the colors, we can, of course, look at the numbers. Uh, one way to do this is by just right-clicking at the respective edge. And then we have uh, the color value here in the attribute uh, box. But that's, that's doable, but we have a better way. We can tick this box, show edge color value. And then we have all the values right here. Um, if it so happens that the colors and the, the fonts uh, overlap, we can also set a background. And then it's even more readable. So now you can be absolutely sure that the numbers here are bigger than the numbers on the other ones. So this gives us a clear indication uh, that we should look at that part of the simulation while it runs. So let's do that. Um, well, actually, since we already have the simulation open anyway, why not right now? And let's fast forward to the part where they all depart again. So, oh, yes, it's about now. Um, all right, so of course, another way to to look at the simulation is to, to color the, the vehicles, for example, by their speed. And then we could also get the impression that there are lots of red colored vehicles in this area. Actually, let's let's go back to the edge data to see exactly which edge we want to look at. Yeah. Broke. Should work. Over. Yeah, so this is the, the road that we want to look at. Now look at it while the simulation is working. This is the first part where everything is going south, so to say. 
now the second part. All right, so what we can see here is that bicycles have to wait at the red line for quite some time. Um, why is that? Let's have a look at the signal plan. So right click here and show phases. This is uh, the, the basic layout here. Now the, the time is on the horizontal axis and on the vertical, we have all the different uh, lights that are being actually, that are being switched by the traffic light. And uh, uh, to really see which lights, which of these uh, horizontal lines we want to look at, we have to uh, show these numbers. Uh, this is the link TLS index. Now for every, for every uh, stream of traffic, we have a number here. Now, this is a bit unfortunate that the numbers are so big. It's a little smaller and we can see what's happening. So 15, 16, 17, 18 are, are the links here. Um, and 15 is uh, the, the right turn, 16 is the straight movement, 17 is the left turn and 18 is a turnaround. If you're not sure which is which, you can always uh, disable the, the rendering of the junction itself, control J, and simply do a right click on, on these internal edges. So there you see this is the thing with the 15 in the end, and this is the thing with the fixed 16 in the end. And this is where the bikes want to go. So going back to this, uh, 15 is here, 16. This is the one that the bikes have to use. Now, if we look at what they had in the beginning, going this way was number one. It's zero, it's one going straight. So already you can see that the one has in this whole overall plan has two green phases, whereas the 16 has only a single green phase. So whenever the signal time was generated, there was some asymmetry in it. Uh, the reason, the exact reason, if you want to know is that here, the, the bicycle lane is part of the road. Uh, and also the, the outgoing bicycle lane is part of the road. Whereas, actually here the same. No, the, the, there's some asymmetry and all the edges that go in there. And there's also a, it's about mostly about the tram that breaks up the symmetry of this intersection. Sorry, I was confused for a moment. So anyway, this uh, generating signal plans for, for complex intermodal intersections is a bit of, well, it's difficult. And so uh, it will happen that the plan that Sumo gives you uh, has some artifacts. In this case, it has this asymmetry between going this way and that way. And so that's one of the reasons why the bikes going back to the train station uh, collect more waiting time. But there's something even more, more subtle going on here. So we have to watch the simulation for a bit and watch it slowly, see what's happening. Can you see this? Um, there is, there are some green lights here on the road, but the bikes are not driving. And as I mentioned, 17 and 18 are the lights that affect the left turn and the turnaround, which the bikes don't want to use. They want to go straight. But for straight, they don't have the green light. They have the red light. And now uh, the traffic actuation says, well, we're detecting traffic here. Probably it wants to go left. So let's keep open the green face. And this is actually what this warning in the very beginning was about. It was, oh, I'm not sure if I can use the detector. I'm not really sure whether what it means if there's a bike on the detector. And then uh, we set this option in the sumo config file that says, well, ignore this. And if the, if the detector is jammed after 30 seconds, then just switch to another phase. So the good news is this left turn phase doesn't last for the maximum possible duration of, in this case, 50 seconds. 
after 30 seconds, it detects that there's a problem, it switches on. But for these 30 seconds, we have a green light with nobody driving. So this uh, is a problem that you can have with an actuated traffic light. So that's a rather advanced thing here. Uh, but just bear in mind, this can happen in your scenarios as well. So this is the mystery of why um, the two plots look so different. Well, the, I guess the, the moral here is the microscopic simulations have lots of details. And if you have lots of details, you have lots of opportunities to, to make things wrong. Um, all right. But on a happier note, let's uh, do let's do something uh, uh, something fancy, something that we never discussed before in a tutorial. Let's run the simulation not only once but multiple times, which you should always do. Of course, we've always been telling you to do this, but we didn't really give you the tools to make this comfortable. You always had to do your own scripting to, to run your simulation multiple times. Now, for those of you who, who still need to uh, need some motivation for why would you even want to run the simulation multiple times, uh, if you have your sumo config uh, and you run it not once but twice, there will be essentially no difference. It will give you the exact same simulation. And this is because there is a random seed, so-called random seed, that's a value that initializes the random number generator. And if you use the same values, the same random numbers come out every time um, and the simulation will behave in the exact same way. But usually you want to make, uh, you want to have runs with different uh, initial values with different random seeds and then see how the randomness affects the scenario. Um, and this is one of the reasons for running multiple times. Um, and the second reason is maybe you have different variants of the same scenario. Maybe you have some parameter that you want to change and then you want to run your scenario with different versions of that parameter. And we're gonna do both things. We're gonna have uh, the simulation we just defined run multiple times with different seats. And then also we're gonna switch off the sublane model. You remember that's the thing that allowed the bikes to, bikes to drive side by side. We're gonna switch this off and also run this model. On all, and it's not even going to be slower because we'll have them run in parallel. So how does that? So let's go to the final folder of the tutorial. And now there's a little, uh, little point of difficulty here. I have to make sure that I start net edit in this folder because in the current version, uh, the tool requires the working directory to be set to the, the folder where all the config files are. And this is one way to initialize the working directory. All right, so now I'm going to use the tool to run seeds. I select the configuration files that I want to run. So now by clicking this little hammer button, I switch to the working directory. Um, and I want sumo configuration files. So let's, let's just switch to all files here. The next version will have a smarter pre-select for the file folder. So I'll select those two config files. I select the number of seats. Let's not have 10, but rather one, two, one, two, zero, one, two, three. And let's run this with a press. And that's it. So I know that this is running eight simulations in the background. And presumably using all my cores. And now one thing you also see is if you change the randomness, sometimes maybe the simulation will behave differently. Actually, this year uncovered an issue with the bicycle behavior uh, at certain seats. Uh, there is a collision in the simulation, which is, of course, something I will look at after the tutorial. Um, but now I can close this, and what do I have? Um, the run seeds tool generated two folders, one for every configuration file. And in each folder, I have multiple versions of the output file, and they are all prefixed with the random seed. As you recall, I used random seeds 
zero to four. So there are prefix for the zero with the one with the two and with the three, which are the, the four runs. Well, that, that runs fast, didn't it? So an easy way to, to have all these different runs. And now, of course, we need to do some analysis. Um, so let's uh, plot the time loss. Um, we already uh, uh, took a look at, uh, at the plotting tool. Mm -hmm. This time we're gonna use some fancier attributes. Uh, we, we want to, we, again, we, we use time loss on the Y axis, but now on the X axis we do, well, we do a rank plot. So basically every, every time loss data point in, the, in, in each of these trip info output files, Mm -hmm. It will be a point on the plot, and we're going to sort them along the x axis by their time loss value. Uh, well, let's just see how that works. And also, we don't care about the IDs of the vehicle, rather, we want to group it by the file name because we want to compare the runs to each other. So, this is why we have this special value of at rank here and at long at prefix things on magic attributes. All right. Now, what's a good way to select all these files at once? You can do a control click and find them all, or I can instead um, sort them by size. This way, they will be close together. And I can do a shift click. And now uh, the unfortunate thing here uh, in the UI is we cannot currently easy collect files from multiple folders. The next version of the run seeds tool actually has an option to put everything in one folder to make this more convenient. Right now I'm gonna do some uh, copy paste. So I'm just gonna copy all the files from the first folder. Then I select all the files from the second folder. And I just paste in what I just copied. So that's not very nice, but it won't stay that way. Now, the rank, time loss, and no ID. And let's go. Ah, yes. I forgot this checkbox. Don't worry about it. The next version won't need the checkbox. Now that's it. Every file that we loaded gives us one line. And uh, we see that the scenarios changed quite a bit. And we also see that there are two groups of lines. Now, I have to um, you can already guess which group of lines corresponds to which configuration file, I guess. So who wants to take a guess? All right, so the, the group with the low time loss, that's the one with the sublane model. And the, the other group with the high time loss, that's the group where we switched off the sublane model because then the capacity on the road is even lower. And of course there's more time loss, but if we want to make sure, we can just go back and switch on the legend. Now, see that uh, the lines with the, with the two, that's from the, from the second uh, configuration file, these are, the upper group and the rank plots just sorts them uh, to, to give you a better visual impression. What you can see is uh, that the lines are have different extent on the X axis. So what does that mean? Each data point is from one byte. We just put them all, sort them all along the X. 
So the different lines mean that the different scenarios have different amounts of bicycles in them, which is to be expected because we, we find our traffic in a very random manner. We use this Poisson flow, uh, which randomized the time from one bike to the next. And so within the span of 1,000 seconds, we're going to have different spacing. And this can end up lead to different amounts of traffic in the scenario within the range is maybe not so high, but it, it adds some spread. And of course, this has quite an impact on the scenario because they interact. And if you have more than uh, likely, they will experience even more time. So I think this is an awesome way to, to have a look at many runs at once. And this, uh, this uh, plotting tool gives you many options to, to get all kinds of plots out of the sumo files. Um, you can find a lot more examples of what this tool can do, uh, bar plots, histograms, uh, just to name a few in the documentation. And also for every output file that Sumo gives you, there is now in the documentation a plotting example to inspire you to, to let, take a look at these dry XML files in a new way. That's what I wanted to show you today. And uh, with this, I conclude my tutorial. Um, so use NetEdit not only to edit your networks, but also to discover all these Python tools that Sumo holds. I think right now it's 60 tools that you can get from that menu. And we didn't even link up all the tools we have. So there's still more to come. Uh, and of course, every tutorial needs uh, to finish with the management to, to use those and work with it. So go ahead. Um, and as always, before you ask, read the documentation. But if you don't find anything in the documentation, then drop us a line, talk to us on the mailing list, and talk to us. We're always looking for project partners. That's it from my end. Thank you for your question.